So if you guys are new to my channel, I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes and I'm gonna say hello to some people and some friends and kind of just acquaint myself with you guys. My name's Joey DeCastro. I'm a, what we call autodatic. I was self-taught. I learned a bunch of things about history and about uh, the rule of law. And what I did is in 2021, I, I spit a bunch of my brain on a wall of things I had learned. And, and what I was able to do is put together a lot of little pieces of history that you may or may not be familiar with. Let's, let's get right into it. So I want to run down this and I'm going to give you guys, if, if you don't know the, the real full picture of history of how marijuana was criminalized and the people who were involved in doing the criminalization of it, why it was criminalized, how it got criminalized, what was the exact apparatus that was put in place to criminalize marijuana, and who were the people that were responsible for doing it, and why did they do it? I just wanna show you guys the different pieces of this that we're gonna be talking about. So, you know, in, in the beginning, you have the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, they're put into the Constitution in 1793. And so then we have this Bill of Rights. And so everything that I'm gonna talk about today is gonna go against these Bill of Rights because the reason why marijuana is criminalized isn't for exactly the reason why you think. So along this timeline here, let me see if I can zoom in. Now, when, when you go down the timeline of prison right here, this is when prison kind of starts. Now you got to see that really there's no substantial prison until prohibition, you can see it. Now right here, there's gonna be a significant bump. Right here, you see that? There's a significant bump right here. And if you wanna check the years, what that's gonna correspond with is prohibition. So it's, it's you see that? So we're gonna go from in 1928, 1929 right here, you're gonna see that there's gonna be a dramatic rise in prison over the next 15 years because prohibition's 1920 to 1933. And remember, you're gonna keep locking people up even after prohibition ends because then you're gonna give a monopoly to a certain amount of people. So now this right here is gonna build the industrial prison complex. That's what the, and this is gonna happen in 1920 to 1933. And this is gonna correspond with I'm up here, Pro Prohibition, right here. 1930, 1920 to 1930. And then if you follow down the prison line, and we're gonna get more into this later, but then you're gonna see how the prison line just becomes this absolute mountain of people living in a dungeon, you know, literally living in dungeons in America. And so, so now the reason I wanted to do this talk was because you know, there's a still an astounding amount of people who are being locked up and put in prisons for marijuana. And so if you don't really know the reason why marijuana is illegal, you have to go back to the people who made it illegal. So, so let's, we're going to go right back here. Now, this guy, his name is Harry Anslinger. He's born in 1892. And so if you just do the math on Harry, now Harry, he's, he's certainly a racist, but Harry is born into a huge family with 10 kids, and I think he's the youngest. And, and so Harry Anslinger, what he wants to do, so let's just, let's just walk back the life of Harry Anslinger if you really want to understand why marijuana is illegal, and I want to help you do it. So Harry Anslinger is back here in 1892. This is when Harry's going to be born. And then from 1892, if you, if you come down here and you, you check the, the lynching chart, you have 161 black people are lynched and, and uh, 89 white people are lynched in this year. So the first 1892 to, to 1902, there's a decrease in lynchings. But Harry Anzinger, he starts working on the railroad when he's 14 and he becomes like this uh, super security cop. And then what a lot of people don't know about Harry Anslinger is that during World War I from 1914 to 1919, Harry Anslinger is going to be a war hero. He's going to go to war and he's going to be a war hero. He's going to learn how to speak German and he speaks three, three or four languages. So he surrounds himself with a couple of people that are going to be clutch 
in, in making sure that, so I don't want to skip some steps here because you have to understand the importance of prohibition before we talk about how marijuana is illegal and why it's illegal. So a lot of people will tell you that they, they're going to say marijuana is illegal because Harry Anzinger was a racist. That's true. Harry Anzinger was a racist. I mean, racist to the core. He, he hate, I mean, there's stories about him and a, and a jazz singer named Billie Jean King that he had her handcuffed to the bed, even on her deathbed for marijuana. Harry's definitely a racist, but Harry's a big opportunist because you have to trace back the years of where he was and what he did. And this is gonna be really important. Remember when I said that Harry Anzinger was a war hero? Well, when he went over to Europe, he served at the Hague. And at the Hague, they, they had this new thing called, 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 it was called the, it, it's now called NATO. <laughs> and so they had began this, this alliance of all the countries over there that would eventually turn into NATO. And his very first friends are the intelligence and secret service and the people who are all involved in the foundation of NATO. And then there's another group forming over there while he's at the Hague going on right there. Can you believe it? Right when he's in the middle of the war in 1914, 1919, there's a group called the World Health Organization forming. And Harry Anzinger is friends with all those people. He's, he's, he hangs out with all of them. He's there at the start of all of these, these, these gigantic things in our world that create the absolute tyrannical police state death state that we live in now. And a big part of it is because of him. So he, he's in war, 1914, 1919, and he makes all these buddies, he makes all these buddies with these people who are, are the new World Health Organization and are gonna be uh, NATO. And so now over time, what happens is, here's what Harry witnesses. When he gets back to the States after being a war hero, he comes back to the height of prohibition because we're with the Volstead Act. I don't, I can't remember all the different things I have on here, but the Volstead Act of 1919 is going to create prohibition with the 18th Amendment in 1920. So Harry Anzinger comes back and he's witnessing all these things. He's seeing all these things. He's seeing this gigantic rise in prison. Now, he's positioned himself. Now, Harry has positioned himself with a very, very rich, because he's involved with the Rockefellers because he works on the railroads. And as you know, John D. Rockefeller was just obsessed with making sure that he could control the railroad cars. The point is though, is that there was the, Harry Anzinger was tapped into these super, super elite, elite rich people. And I'm gonna go over some of them now. So, now, Harry comes back from the war and he sees, he sees all of these, these cops arresting people for alcohol. And he's a part of it. He's, 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 in special, that, I mean, this guy, you have no idea. You want to talk about a guy who, who maximized his potential? Uh, Harry Anslinger did that. So now he starts working really closely with William Randolph Hirsch and Lamont DuPont. These become his buddies. These become his guys. And, and William Randolph Hearst, you know, when he makes newspapers back then, you're talking about lots and lots of wood. And so he's bought like a million quarts or tons. Of, he's bought a, a whole bunch of wood, a whole bunch of wood that he's bought. And so he, he can't have the hemp industry from marijuana competing. And then on this side, uh, Lamont DuPont, this guy right here, he is involved in the pharmaceutical industry and he's involved in the plastic industry. And you know, there's this, there's this ever, there's this ever growing idea in our country. And a lot of us still today believe that there's some miracle cures inside of marijuana. It certainly works for epileptic kids. We know that. And so, so the point is though, is these men, they want to, they want to criminalize marijuana for sure. And so what are they going to do and how are they going to do it? Well, they use the 1914 Harrison Act, which this, this 1914 Harrison Act, this is, this is where you have to get your, your prescription for marijuana from your doctor now. That's what that does. And so now remember who I told you he's involved with. He's involved with the, with the Rockefeller business down here. He's, he's involved with John D. Rockefeller, right? And so John D. Rockefeller, when the breakup of Standard Oil happens in 1911, then that's gonna trigger the Harrison Act. And why is it gonna trigger the Harrison Act? Because, because when, you, when you break up Standard Oil in 1911, the Harrison Act, that's gonna make it so you have to get a prescription for marijuana. They wanna kill the hemp industry because 
the oil industry, when it gets broken up into seven different families, they don't want to compete with the hemp industry. That's why you have John D. Rockefeller's picture down here. Even though John D. Rockefeller at this point was chairman of the board, uh, you know, he's still running stuff. He's still the man. You know, he's still the man. He lives a long life. This guy, John D. Rockefeller, I'm, I'm, sure, you, I'm sure you heard him before. Now, you're going to get, now, to be perfectly honest with you, and, and this is just, and remember, I'm just going off this stuff on the top of my head that I just know. So, Harry Anslinger's uncle, it, it, I, and, I'm, and I'm not sure if it's his uncle, but I can't remember. I, I can't, I, now that my brain is, is, now there's reports that it was his wife's uncle, there's reports that it was his uncle, but he was the secretary of the treasure. And he was the secretary of the treasurer for Franklin Delano Roosevelt for one year in 1937. And he's going to pass the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act right there. And this is the act that is going to take the 1911 Harrison Act a step forward and just focusing only on marijuana. Only on marijuana. So... So in 1914, you have the Harrison Act, and it has a lot to do with the breakup of Standard Oil. And then in 1937, you're going to have the Marijuana Tax Act that's going to make it so you have to have a tax permit to be able to sell marijuana to anybody. So not even doctors or pharmacies are going to be able to sell marijuana. Why is this happening, though? You, you, you know, the reason why I put so, many, so much data points on this graphic is because I want you guys to think about why it's happening. It's not... It's not as easy as just saying, this is what happened. It, it, Harry Anzinger is your prime mover. He, remember, prohibition ends in 1933, and everybody's relieved because you can have a drink again. But what he's going to do is he's going to go on, the, on the, the, the Senate floor, and he's going to lay out this racist tirade. He's going to say that smoking marijuana makes darkies think that they're as good as whites. That if you give marijuana to a 14-year-old girl, that she will go off with black guys and get syphilis. The entire word mahawana was created so that you would think about Mexicans coming across the border. And he said a couple more things disparaging about Mexicans as well. I just can't remember exactly what they were, but I remember specifically it makes darkies think that they're as good as whites. So he sold this to Congress in 1937. He's the one that did it. He sold it. He sold the bill, and 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 they signed it into law. This this is kind of a good moment to kind of reflect on what Harry Anslinger had witnessed, what the power of prohibition could do when you criminalize the chemical that a lot of people loved to do. So when I say that Harry Anslinger comes back from the war, so remember 1892, 1902, 1912. So he's 20 years old. Prohibition is going to begin when he's 28 years old. So he's going to watch Prohibition happen from 1920 to 1933, 28, 38, almost 48. He's 45 years old. And so as a 45-year-old man, he's going to reflect back and look and say, well, what were the effects? What, were, what was the, you know, there's cause and effect. So what is the, the affect of of what prohibition did because he was always in to policing, into security, into law enforcement. You know, I, don't, I think the term wasn't even coined until the 60s. But so Harry Anzinger, as a 45 year old man, when prohibition comes to an end, he looks around the landscape and he says, well, what do I have here? You know, I have I have partnerships because go ahead and Google what Harry Anzinger is worth today, a man who was born into poverty. He says, I have these partnerships with these guys, and this is the Secretary of Treasury, the Secretary of the Treasury in 1937. He dies right after he creates the Marijuana Tax Act. So what does Harry Anzinger witness in, in, in 1933 at the end of Prohibition? If he's born in 1892, then in, in 1933 at the end of Prohibition, this man's 41 years old. So he's 41 years old in 1933, and he's gonna pass the Marijuana Tax Act when he's 45. And so you say, why is he doing it? What, what's his motivation? Well, he's trying to protect DuPont's plastic and pharmaceutical industry. And he's trying to protect William Randolph Hearst's industry. And he's trying to protect all the oil families who don't want hemp to be a viable product for energy. Because the Indians are thinking about using hemp for energy. So, 
And then you're going to get into all kinds of different things, but I want to stay focused on Harry. So what does Harry see as far as the empowerment that law enforcement, that policing is going to get from the, the boons and the benefits that lean towards the state from prohibition? And so you're going to get 1925, Carroll versus United States, which is going to create the Carroll Doctrine. And the Carroll Doctrine, as you guys can see, there's only one thing in red tape on my entire wall here, and it's the Carroll Doctrine, which creates the exigent circumstances clause. Because alcohol had been such a problem when J. Edgar Hoover was poisoning the bottles of alcohol because he wasn't going to let bootleg bootleggers win. So this creates the exigent circumstances clause. And that's the, the three circumstances. Are if the, the police believe there's going to be a loss of life, if the police say they're in hot, hot pursuit of you, or if the police say they need to seize evidence off of you, and this specifically is you're transporting illegal alcohol. Because remember, like I said, after 1933, the bulk of people being arrested is still for alcohol. Follow me that? So the people who are involved with, with making and creating alcohol after prohibition is lifted in 1933, if they don't get the proper permits and licenses and, and, and inspectors to approve their distillery or for them to be able to create alcohol, then they're still going to jail. So this exigent circumstance clause from 1925, based on the Carroll Doctrine, which is a really fancy way to say, strip all of your fundamental rights for warrantless searches. This is a complete invasion. And the reason why they say that they have to create the Carroll Doctrine is because your car can drive away. Your car can just drive away and then you're gonna, you're gonna get away with the alcohol. So they just can't let you do it. The, the state can't let you in. And this is the height of prohibition. So Harry Anzinger sees the Carroll Doctrine come and go. Prohibition ends in 1933, but Harry sees, look, look at the power. Look how much more power this gives to cops. Look how much power this gives to security. If we just say that there's edges and circumstances, Harry sees this and goes, oh man, this is great. So now if he creates a literally a boogeyman out of blacks and Mexicans to criminalize marijuana on the, on the, on the congressional floor, that's what he does. That's what he does. And so he criminalized, so he goes on the congressional floor, he criminalizes marijuana by saying some racist crap. But the truth is, is that he criminalized marijuana and he sold that to the House of Representatives and to the senators based on racism. But the truth was that he was in it for the money. What else does Harry see? Harry sees the Carroll versus United States pass. Harry sees the 1928 Olmstead versus United States. And so, you know, Harry's not a dumb guy. Remember, he learns German to be a double agent for the United States in World War I. He, he's, he's no dunce cap. Harry Anzinger's a very smart guy. So in 1928 in Olmsted versus the United States, this is where J. Edgar Hoover taps into the phone lines of Lieutenant Roy Olmsted, a lieutenant for the Seattle Police Department who's running alcohol between Seattle and Canada through the ferry system. And he gets popped. And then he goes to jail. And what Harry Anzinger sees is that the William Howard Taft court and William Howard Taft is going to write the holding, civil liberties be damned. If you break the law and we catch you, your civil liberties don't matter. He literally says that in the holding. You can look it up in Olmstead. Well, Harry says, civil liberties be damned. I'm all for that. I, I, I hate blacks and I hate Mexicans and I want to run them out of the country. It, when he reads the holding from Roy Olmsted, remember 1928, there's no TV going home. You're not clicking through Sports Center. Put it in cultural context, put it in understanding. If you work in policing, when the Supreme Court writes a holding in 1928, what do you do? You read it. So Harry Anzinger clearly sees and learns that the previous president of the United States and now Supreme Court Chief Justice said civil liberties be damned in Olmstead versus United States based on prohibition. Harry Anslinger has a vested interest in creating a demon out of marijuana and so he does. And so he does. He creates multiple films um, reefer madness. You guys can look that up. I believe it's 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 created in 1936 because Harry's going to make his 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 pitch to Congress in 1937. So, you know, he's seeing the immense amount of power that the government will give you if you can criminalize 
a chemical and he's a part of it. He's, he's not only witnessing it, he's, he's now gonna become the head of the FNA, the Federal Narcotics Agency. I believe that's gonna be 19, 1930. The head of the Federal Narcotics Agency it was called the FNA, now called the DEA. And he becomes the head of the Federal Narcotics Agency in 1930. And then, it be, and then in 1937, the reason why he makes the speech to Congress is because he's head of the Federal Narcotics Agency which is now the DEA, which is the worst organization in all of America. So, so what has he seen now? It's the, 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 the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court says civil liberties be damned. His uncle or his uncle-in-law passes the Marijuana Tax Act. And then Carroll versus United States makes it so cops can warrantlessly search your car if they say that they're looking for illegal substances. So he has a vested interest in making sure that the marijuana tax acts pass, and then he starts to pass different. And then you're going to get the 1952 Boggs Act that is going to be written by Harry Anslinger and his team. And this is going to make it so that if you even have just one joint, it's 10 years in prison. And he's doing this. Well, we know why he's doing it because he still doesn't want anybody to be able to compete with the, with the fossil fuel industry, with the pharmaceutical industry or the newspaper or energy business. So that's why Harry is doing all of these things. So th th now it's not just gonna end here because it's, I, I wanna take you back in time just a little bit. You remember back in 1914 to 1919, Harry Anzinger's in World War I and he's at The Hague. And at The Hague, they started this new thing called the World Health Organization. And so when the World Health Organization starts up, they become this very powerful bureaucracy around the world that if they say something, well, then it must be true. If the World Health Organization warns you, well, then you should be afraid. I think we experienced that in 2020, right? Fear, 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 right? So, so... Now, the Boggs Act of 1952, it's, it's pretty good, but it doesn't really shut down the entire hemp and marijuana business. And really, that's Harry and his partner's goal. He, they don't ever want marijuana to compete with the plastic industry. Remember, you know, hemp can be grown in a summer and regrown, and so you're gonna compete with the, the wood industry and the fossil fuel industry. You're gonna have energy industry, you're gonna have uh, you can use hemp for all kinds of things. And then the pharmaceuticals of uh, Lamont DuPont, he doesn't want to compete at all with the pharmaceuticals. And we don't know the, all the health benefits that the, the, the CBD from, from cannabis offers you. So now the Boggs Act is going to be one thing, but Harry, he really wants to make sure his interests are protected. He's going to die with $20 million or something like that, born into poverty, and he was a cop. If you look up, funny, if you look up on Wikipedia, I think it says he was an actor. Well, what films was he in? How did he die with $20 million? Because he was involved with these guys in, the, in these businesses. So now what happens? You're going to get in 1961, right. you're going to have the World Health Organization. You see it right there? And what the World Health Organization is going to be invited to the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. And what are the narcotic drugs that they're talking about? Marijuana. This entire convention is based on marijuana being held in New York City. Who's throwing the convention? Harry Anslinger's throwing the convention. He's the guy... Who, who has at the Ritz Carlton and all that. So I, don't, I can't remember if it's the Ritz, but he had it at some hotel. So he flew in a bunch of um, diplomats from all over the world. And some of the diplomats that he flew in to attend the single convention on narcotic drugs was this group called the World Health Organization, the guys that he had met in, the, in World War I. So, so in 1961, Harry Anzinger goes on and he tells the people in the audience, and remember, 61, you just have TVs coming out in the 50s. So Harry Anzinger, 1961, with the, with the World Health Organization at the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, he then states that smoking marijuana will turn you or turn your child into an ax murderer, that it can turn you into a killer like that. You could take one puff of marijuana and you might be comatose for the rest of your life. And this is what Harry Anzinger teaches this, this is what he teaches to, to the masses of America. And there's all these films coming out, you know, Reefer Madness is one of them, but there's dozens of them where, 
where where it's depicting the idea that you will become a homicidal killer. The big one was the axe killings, that if the, 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 some kid killed some people with an axe and then they said, oh, he was on marijuana. It was because of the marijuana. I think they used a marijuana defense in his trial and said, oh, it was the marijuana. I mean, if you kill somebody with an ax, it's not marijuana, it's not any drug, you're just whacked. <laughs> so now, so at the single convention on narcotic drugs, where the World Health Organization is gonna make this grandiose speech, how um, their rec the World Health Organization is gonna then, what they're gonna do is they're gonna give a list of recommendations of what should happen with the cannabis plant, the marijuana plant, and they recommend that all marijuana plants are eradicated from planet Earth within 25 years. That's, that's what comes out of the single convention on narcotic drugs. The recommendation, so that's 1961. So by 1985, every single marijuana plant across the globe was supposed to be torn up and destroyed because there was absolutely zero medicinal benefits from it. Now, so you say to yourself, well, what can be the ramifications of having a convention on marijuana? Because I keep on saying single convention on narcotic drugs, but marijuana is not a narcotic. So, so then you say to yourself, well, well, what happens from there? So it gets put on a schedule one. Now, what could be the, what, what could be the ramifications from, from that happening? So the, the ramifications of Kerr versus, uh, of, of the 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs is the Kerr case. And this is where um, Diana Kerr, I think her name was, she's driving home. The cops say that they're in hot pursuit using exigent circumstances. And so because they say that they're in hot pursuit, then they go to her landlord and get a key to her apartment without a warrant and go into her apartment. And then they find this brick of marijuana on the kitchen table. They arrest the Kerrs. The Kerrs appeal the case. It goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, no, 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 it's fine. It's perfectly legal. They can do it. They, they change the rules to knock and announce. This is the, so you guys have heard how cops have to knock on the door before they, they come running in. That's based on Kerr versus California. They just tap, tap, tap on your door. And this Kerr versus California, tap, tap, tap on your door and then come in. They just burst your door down. So they go, tap, 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 police, police. Four, three, boom, door kicks open. That's how it goes. And that's the knock and announce thing is based on Kerr versus California. And really this is just an answer to the 1961 map versus Ohio, where the, where the Supreme Court said that you had to have a warrant to go into Dolores Map's house. And the reason why this happened is because Earl Warren was gonna be impeached. And so Matt versus Ohio that says you have to have a warrant. Well, they just went around that in 63. Just tap on the door, say you're there, and you can kick the door down and go running in. So Kerr versus California, one of the worst holdings in US history, and still on the books today and still legal today, cops can just knock on your door and run in, is based off marijuana being illegal. From Harry Anzinger, pitching this, 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 this bullpucky at the single convention on narcotic drugs with the World Health Organization coming in and saying their lies, how it will turn your kid into a killer. And so now cops can just knock on your door, announce that they're there and come running in. So now that's not the whole reason why marijuana is illegal. It goes deeper down a rabbit hole. So, so now you're gonna have the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. So I'm not sure if you guys know any, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys do, but there's a time period in history right here, right through all the 60s right here, where you really kind of got to determine, you know, who was for equality and who was racist. And so, you know, I can go over all these people and we can talk about all of them, but, but there was just a time period where there's a, you know, people were racist or they were not racist. And it's just the way it was. This is just how it was. So, so now when you come here in 1970, you're going to have the Controlled Substance Act that's going to be written by a guy named John Mitchell. Now, John Mitchell is going to have to resign in disgrace because he's a criminal. He's going to have to resign. He's Richard Nixon's attorney general. And what he does is he goes into a room by himself with a couple of aides, a couple of lawyers, and he writes the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 along with all the penalties for it because the model penal code that's going to be written from 1952 to 1960, 
the model penal code is going to be written from 1952 to 1962. It's going to be written by, by Wechsler. Um, and um, and the, the point is, though, th this, there's, there's nothing in the model penal code about drug penalties. There's nothing in there. So the model penal code, which is a horrible, horrible piece of legislation, but it's not even close to as bad as the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 that is still used often today. So John Mitchell, who actually was a racist, yeah, this guy was a racist piece of garbage. He wrote the 1970 Controlled Substance Act specifically in mind to arrest black people. And so then here was the deadly combination. So I know there's a lot of poor white people who, who are suffering from police abuse today too. So I don't, it's not just a racial issue, but this certainly had racism all over it. So in 1960, 1968 with Terry versus Ohio that I didn't touch with the marijuana, but, but Terry versus Ohio is based on the jurisprudence, the stare decisis is Kerr versus California. Kerr versus California doesn't happen without the 1961 single convention on narcotic drugs. I digress. So the 1970 Substance Control Act, when you combine that with Terry versus Ohio, what does Terry versus Ohio do? It allows a police officer to enter into your life if he has reasonable, articulable suspicion. Well, the 1970 Controlled Substance Act criminalizes marijuana big time. It's a felony. You're going to go to prison. So when you couple the 1970 Controlled Substance Act written by a racist uh, and then passed using a racist law, Terry versus Ohio, Terry, Terry, Terry policies were certainly based on race 100%. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's our history. Don't get mad at me. At least you heard the truth. You're not listening to some bullshit. So the Substance Control Act is gonna, when you couple that with Terry versus Ohio, where a cop can walk up to you and say that they're suspicious of you, then, then what happens is any cop can say that he spilled marijuana and there, there's no, who, who's, gonna, who's gonna say that he's not, he was lying? So who's he arresting? Most likely a black dude because Terry versus Ohio was created to run up and grab black dudes, whether you like it or not, it was. So in 1970 with the Substance Control Act, which is gonna have, make marijuana a felony, with Terry versus Ohio in 68, and then the Substance Control, the Substance Control Act in 1970, you, you, you just create this one-two punch that gives all the power to policing. What did I say earlier? What was Harry Anzinger witnessing? Harry Anzinger was witnessing that it gave police amazing power to criminalize a chemical. And so now that's exactly what's happening here. So it, and, and so how long does that last? It's still going on today. What do cops say today? I smell marijuana. What's that based on? Johnny Mitchell right in the 1970 Substance Control Act. So this is gonna get even worse right here because the 1970 Controlled Substance Act is then gonna end up being this catalyst for what Richard Nixon is gonna do in 1971 where he's gonna declare the war on drugs. And when he declares the war on drugs, this guy, his name was uh, uh, Pinky is, is his, his nickname was Pinky. He was the he was the he, he was the secretary, uh, uh, the attorney general for Richard Nixon, and so and so this guy here, he's going to fund and and start. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke here. He worked for he worked he worked for Ronald Reagan. This guy here, John Ehrlichman, he was the guy who worked for Richard Nixon. So so now right here, when when Richard Nixon declares war on drugs, what's going to happen here? is he's gonna make it so that police departments get funded based on how many drug arrests they do. And he's gonna turn all nine cannons of the government to chasing down this war on drugs. And so, so this is gonna fundamentally twist our country, even though we're gonna find out later he's a criminal. And so, and so, is, his, so, is, his, so is his attorney general, John Mitchell. They're, they're both criminals. They both have to resign in shame. So we still have the war on drugs. And this is a perpetuation of Harry Anslinger's war on humanity. It's just so pathetically sad. It's just so disgusting, you know, that we still perpetuate this war on drugs when we know 
who John Ehrlichman, who was one of his, I think it was one of his, uh, in, in, I don't think it was in his cabinet, but Ehrlichman, you can look him up, John Ehrlichman, he's the one who, who said that Richard Nixon only declared war on drugs to, to arrest hippies and blacks. That's why he did it. He's declared war on drugs. So he had a way to do it. So as we go down the progression here, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And how do we know it got worse and worse and worse? Because when you read the Knapp Commission of 1972, so you got the marrow, you, you have the, the Knapp Commission of 1972. This is going to outline that the cops are doing all the marijuana running, that they're the, they're the big kingpins of marijuana, that they're on the take, that the cops are doing all of the robbing and stealing, and that since there's a Substance Control Act and there's a war on drugs, these guys are the biggest drug runners there are in America. It's the cops, and it's in the NAP, it's in the NAP report. You guys can read it. It's on my website for free. I mean, you can look it up yourselves. Now that we know that the cops are running the drugs and that and that it's just, they're gonna, if you get arrested for marijuana, you're gonna go to jail for years and years because it's a felony. As you come down the line here, the war on drugs is just perpetuated big time. And this is where I got confused by Ronald Reagan. He's the one, the for-profit prison industry in 1980 to arrest anybody and put them in prison for decades and decades. But if you go back to 1980, when he created this for-profit prison industry, Remember what they were chasing through here. It was, it was marijuana all the way up until the 80s. And then it became cocaine and barbiturates, actual narcotics. But then the for-profit prison industry, the number one reason why people were arrested in the United States was for marijuana for years and years and years. I don't know if that's still the case. I think it is. So then the 1994 crime bill right here, what, what this is going to do, this is going to make it so that police departments get funding based on how many drug arrests they make. So, so they get their money based on how many people they arrest and put in jail for drugs. So this incentivizes police in a much bigger way. And you're going to have civil asset forfeiture that's really going to come in in a big way during the Clinton administration. Who's the, who is, the, who is the, the, the main proponent and the main advocate for, for creating the civil asset forfeitures? Well, it's going to be Joe Biden. Joe Biden's going to write all that stuff. Joe Biden is going to write all that civil asset forfeiture and, and, and criminal asset forfeiture for Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton's going to put it through with his wife. So, so they can steal everything you have. Now, so the 94 crime bill, what this does specifically is it creates the cops program, it cre the criminal <laughs> community oriented policing services, cops, COPS, cops program. And this also creates Operation Relentless Pursuit. And then the same year that the 94 crime bill comes out, the 1994 Mullen Commission comes out that says for the past couple decades, it's just gotten worse and worse in policing, that police are the pimps, police are dealing with the drug dealing, police are, are involved in every single gang there is, the Crips and the Bloods, the head of one of them was a cop. So, you know, all these things are happening and they're giving more power to cops through the 94 crime bill, more funding, more training, more money, and the 94 Mullen, uh, Mullen Commission comes out and Billy Bob has funded all these cops and then he, he funded a commission to tell us that the cops are really terrible. Now, I want to get a little bit more into the legal side of why marijuana is illegal. Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia is the reason why marijuana is illegal to this day. These two here. So, you know, I... <laughs> You know, I've, I've read a lot of their cases. You know, I can go over a lot of their cases. I can go over the cases. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is, is hailed as a champion for women's rights. The truth is she was a champion for equality. You know, one of her cases that was for equality is where a female lieutenant in the military had this career because she was a female lieutenant in the military and her spouse, her husband, couldn't get benefits. And she sued the federal government and she won and got that the spouse who was a husband got him benefits to the military just because he was a man shouldn't have, have lost his, his rights to getting spousal support. And so Anthony Scalia, Anthony Scalia, he, a lot of people will call him, he called himself a textualist. He called himself a textualist. And you can listen to a lot of his interviews on YouTube, but let me just tell you something. These two people, are, 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 are inconsistent. 
So Scalia is this big constitutionalist where he's a textualist, where he believes that what's written in the Bill of Rights and the Tenth Amendment, the federal government has so many laws that were created in the Tenth Amendment. And then after that, the power goes back to the people. So, so in three separate cases, I want to show you how marijuana is illegal to this day. And then I'll, I'll be right about an hour, which is how long I wanted to spend doing this. So as you guys know, what happens is, is you vote for your representative, whether that be a state representative or a federal or, or, or someone who goes to the House of Representatives in Congress at the federal level. And so, so your state senators and the representatives in your state, they will write laws and then the executive will sign the law into effect. And what the, the functionality of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia, they're, they're truly the only functionality they're supposed to, to, to do is to uphold whether or not the law that was written by your representative, whether that be state or federal law, if it's constitutional. If it passed the muster of the, ten, the first 10 amendments and every amendment after up until the 26th amendment. So, so that's their job is to determine the constitutionality of law that was written by the people in the House and the Senate and then signed into law by the executive, be it your governor or the president. So, of course, all the time, the government is trying to create laws to stifle our liberty. <laughs> Just I mean, truth be told. There's three cases here that will, will show you that these two people they're, they're just not good people. So in the 1995 case of United States versus Lopez, this case is based on uh, Lopez bringing a gun to school. And then the reason he brought the gun to school was to sell it. And so they used the Commerce Clause, the Interstate Commerce Clause, which is part of the 10th Amendment. You have the Interstate Commerce Clause. And, and they say that Interstate commerce can be affected by kids bringing guns to school, so they created an act saying that you couldn't have a, a gun within 500 yards of a school. And, that, and so Lopez goes to court and they challenge this law that said that you couldn't be within 500 yards of a school with a gun. And so they used the Interstate Commerce Clause to try to create that. And so Scalia voted and he said, no, you can't do that. And then Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, yes, I want to, I, I think we should uphold United States versus Lopez. Well, Scalia wins and Lopez gets struck down. So the, the gun law that made it so you couldn't have a gun within 500 yards of a school gets struck down because they use the Commerce Clause. And he says, no, 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 you can't use the Commerce Clause to regulate a civil liberty that you're born with. So then down the line here in United States versus Morrison, they're going to vote on the Violence Against Women's Act. It, a woman is allegedly raped in a college. And then she can't go back to school. And so they use the interstate commerce clause and saying that if women are raped at college campuses, you know, and this is a crude dis dis description of this, but, but then it's going to affect interstate commerce because people go to school out of state. Well, it goes to the Supreme Court and Scalia says, no, you can't use interstate commerce clause for the Violence Against Women's Act. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, yes, you can. Well, Scalia wins and says, um, so the Violence Against Women's Act gets struck down as being unconstitutional. Okay, so now in Gonzalez versus Rake, which that's how you say the name is Rake. And I, I actually have been saying it wrong for so long that I wanted to know how to say it properly, so I looked it up. So in Gonzalez versus Rake, this is about homegrown marijuana. And so these medicinal marijuana patients in California, two different ones, they, they want to make sure that they're not gonna be raided by the FBI or the DEA for growing homegrown marijuana. So at the Supreme Court level, they're using the Interstate Commerce Clause to make it illegal for homegrown marijuana. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, uh, yeah, let's make sure marijuana stays illegal and use the Interstate Commerce Clause. She's being consistent though, she's voted for the Interstate Commerce Clause in the past two cases. Well, Scalia changes his mind. And he says, he votes, um, he, <laughs> he says that you, you're not using the Interstate Commerce Clause, you're using the Necessary and Proper Clause because the states have a right to regulate uh, their have policing powers. And so he sh switches his vote from these two cases to make sure that marijuana stays criminalized in Gonzalez versus Reich. Rake, that's how you say your name. So, so, you know, so these two guys at the end of the day work together and then just so you know, here's the funny part. Here is the funniest part, right? So then in the dissent in Gonzalez versus uh, Rake, 
you know, Clarence Thomas is going to write a dissent and he's going to be joined by Rehnquist. And then Kennedy's going to switch sides and vote with him and uh, write in alliance with him that they're using the, the necessary and proper clause, not the interstate commerce clause. Well, I hope you guys learned something. And I, I, I tried to keep this um, as PG as I could. Hit the like button. Would you hit the like button for me? Just do me a favor and hit the like button button. Just take your finger real quick and hit the like button. If you would, please hit the like button. Everybody, just, just take your finger and tap, tap, tappy, tap the like button. If you would, pretty please, with sugar and cherry on top, that would be great. Just hit the like button. Thanks. Well, I just wanted to show you guys the, the, the crazy history of marijuana and, and let you guys understand how, how this went totally bad. Uh, and, and, it, and, and so, you know, and just so you guys know, you know, a, a, a lot of black folks to this day still believe that marijuana was criminalized because of racism. It was criminalized using racism. Now, if you're black in America today, you're four times to be more likely arrested by that cop for having marijuana on you, even though it may be legal in your state. And these are basic statistics that you can look up. If there's four people standing in a circle, one of those black guys could be arrested. And that's, that's a factual thing. Now, if you live in a small town that's poor and white, you, you, you know, you might be, um, you might be the target of their investigation for marijuana. You can't deny the racism that, that the laws were created around, and you can't deny that our criminal injustice system ha has, has had a lot of racism in it. And the whole detainment process is created by Terry versus Ohio, which is completely criminal, completely criminal. It's unconstitutional. There are racist people in the world. I don't think there's as many racist people as government agencies that have racist policies, but there are racist people in the world who don't like people because of, you know, me amo Jose Maria. You know, they don't like me because my name is Jose. They don't like people because of the color of their skin. They don't like people because they can't speak English. There's all kinds of racist people. So uh, race does matter for sure, you know, but at the same time, it's happening to all of us now. The police are targeting every person they can. Now every one of us is a piggy bank. You know, it used to be just to oppress black people, and now it's it's a piggy bank system where they're making money off of us. You know, they're making so much money off of us. They really are. They really, really are. Race isn't black and white. No, it's brown. The most killed by police per capita is brown people. It's the, the most killed by people, by, by police. Anyway, listen, all right, I want to get the flock out of here. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. So this was just a quick rundown on the history of marijuana. I'm going to get the flock out of here. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I really do appreciate you coming. Thanks. And I will see you guys on the next one. We don't stop. We don't stop. We don't stop.